Hello everybody, welcome. Uh, let me check the audio here, it looks like it's peaking just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I'm Scott, I'm with Artist Network, this is Drawing Together, so welcome. We've got a large group um, ready to work on this photo of the lily, or drawing of the photo. Um, so if you are joining us for the first time, you want to know that the reference image is in the description below. You'll find a link to it as well as other links to additional drawing resources. Um, welcome everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces here. I don't have time to call everybody out because I really want to get into this one today. Um, I chose to work in graphite for this one. Uh, I've done a couple um, floral drawings throughout the series, both done in charcoal, so I thought I'd switch to graphite so we can see how that applies. Um, one of the things that always held me back in those previous two um, from moving into to graphite was uh, the belief that the graphite just didn't quite have the the contrast, the value kind of punch that I was looking for. Um, but with this reference photo um, and with a little bit more practice with the graphite, I feel like we can get somewhere pretty close. I, you know, this still doesn't quite have that richness of, of value contrast that charcoal can provide. But I think that also kind of plays into just the delicacy of this subject. Um, so there are going to be a lot of things that we cover, and in part, it's really going to be about edges and when. All right, <laughs> we're back here. Sorry for the interruption. Not sure what happened. My computer decided it didn't want to use that that Wi-Fi network and, and just switched in the middle of it. So um, hopefully we're not going to have any additional interruptions here. But if if we do, um, typically things are resolved very quickly. So just hang on. So if everything seems to freeze, just um, just hang on for just a second. And this does go up as a recording afterwards, so you'll be able to watch that. Um, so. Hopefully that the little scare doesn't scare anybody away, but um, so let's get right into it. Um, this is an 11 by 14 piece of paper that I'm working on. It's just a smooth sheet of paper, nothing fancy. I'm just working with my ebony pencil here. This is a Prism Prismacolor ebony pencil. If you happen to have a 4B or 6B, that's going to be generally equivalent to this. If you have a carbon pencil, I think that's also going to work out really well. And if all you have is a regular yellow number two pencil, that's going to work great as well. Um, I have my shading stump, which I didn't use a whole lot in this initial study. I have my rubber eraser and my kneaded eraser. Um, now, having done quite a few graphite drawings with this rubber eraser, it was really starting to build up graphite. And it kind of it threw me off uh, in, a, in a few moments where because it Basically, what was happening as the graphite builds up on this, as I was trying to erase, it was just ingraining the graphite into the paper rather than actually erasing. So what I did to clean it off, if you have a dirty rubber eraser, just take your kneaded eraser and try to pick off as much as you can. Um, just using your uh, you know, thumb or, or even some sandpaper can be helpful also in removing some of it. But just try to clean it off if you can, and that, that might be useful. Because we're going to be using the eraser quite a bit in this. Um, there's a lot of positive space, negative space, and a lot of additive and subtractive processes. So to, to achieve some of these highlights here, I was actually erasing out um, to get to that white of the paper rather than trying to preserve it. And that's also what I did down in this area here. Um, so just to try to reinforce that delicacy. So again, this is all about edges, and I want to see if we can confront those edges in a lot of different ways. Um, you'll also notice that I, I really simplified the background. There's all that grass behind there that I just ignored all together. So um, hopefully, let's see, yeah, it looks like we might have uh, some bandwidth issues, so things are a little bit out of focus. Um, let's see, hopefully everybody's back in. I think our, I think at least internet, everything seems to be clear on my end, so, and I'm about 30 seconds in front of you guys, so hopefully everything is going to smooth out. Um, so just to get started, um, I've got the reference image in front of me here. Um, I've got the the paper projected on the screen right in front of me here um, that's using that camera that's overhead so I can see what it looks like at a smaller scale. Um, so I think that's going to be helpful for you all to um, be ready to kind of step back from your work and make sure you're, you're checking it vertically. So if you're working fairly horizontally like I am throughout the process, keep tipping it up so that you can kind of adjust your proportions. Now getting the proportions right for this may be a little less critical than say like a portrait. Um, but in, but we still want to be generally close 
to what we have here. So um, to get started, what I want to do is I want to start thinking almost about this as a reverse silhouette. So I want to start mapping in the basic shape of the flower by drawing the negative space around it. So using the side of my pencil, you can see that I've shaved away the wood casing to expose that core, and that allows me to really engage the side of the pencil rather than the point. And that's going to be helpful um, because I, I don't want any permanent lines. And with a harder material like graphite, um, it's more prone to kind of embossing the page and leaving marks on the surface that you may then have to contend with later. Uh, so just be kind of mindful of that in these early stages because if you're using the point of the blob uh, pretty easily you have to do some work to try to get rid of that line a little bit later. Uh, so I'm just, I've got, I've got my wrist locked, I'm drawing from my shoulder um, and I'm giving myself just a rough approximation of the form. I need something to look at um, so that then I can make calculated decisions about what needs to change. I know this is inaccurate at this point, which is, which is healthy. And hopefully at this stage, as you're blocking things in, you're not too concerned with it being accurate. It's mostly about getting information on the page. So if you're new, um, that may be something that's new for you, but if for all of you returning viewers, um, you hear me say that over and over again, you wanna be um, skeptical about your proportions throughout the entire drawing. Uh, never assume that things are correct. Um, maybe what you end up doing is, is uh, kind of locking in on one small element that doesn't move throughout the drawing and that everything else moves around it. But at this stage, you want to assume that everything can be moved. It's like we're drawing in sand right now. We're, um, we're making marks that can be easily removed. Uh, one of the other advantages to using the side of the pencil at this stage is that the, the graphite floats on the surface of the paper a bit more uh, and it's going to be more easy to erase away from it. Um, and so just try to be using the, the side of the pencil. Uh, the other thing that I, I did in the initial study is I uh, created a gradation in that background to provide some contrast because if we look over, over on this side of the drawing of the flower, um, there's that, uh, there's a, the, the, the flower that hasn't opened up. We see the bud there and then we see half shadow, half light. Um, and and so I want to kind of play around with some of that value contrast. So if I make it darker over here, increase the contrast as they come across here, I want elements where that flower is darker than that background. So I'll kind of explain that a bit more as we go along. Uh, but one of the things that I can see right off the bat is that I've drawn this fairly large on the paper, so I'm not going to have room for the rest of the flower, that I, and I really want that. Uh, so what I want to do is actually kind of come in a little bit, and I'm just thinking about the overall mass of the flower. Uh, again, it's not about accuracy at this point, but it gave me enough information to evaluate uh, and make a decision about the scale on the, on the paper. And, and, I, and I'm able to make that large decision um, without having spent a significant amount of time uh, rendering. So that's one of the advantages to this process of kind of building everything up as we go um, because um, you know we want to make these big decisions very quickly and decisively early on before we get into the rendering phase where we can really eat up a lot of time. Uh, so I'm, now that I have more information on there I have something that I can use um, to start making more specific decisions. So, for example, as I start to draw this part of the flower here, I'm comparing it to this petal that's open and it looks like it's directly in line with that. Um, I can start to see the axis of some of these um, petals forming. And you can see the edges. I'm not being careful at all with them. We're going to be moving into the, um, we're going to be moving into more accuracy as we go along. And so if I look at this, I'm going to bud here. I want to get a sense for whether or not it's going to fit. And it still feels really too, too close to that edge. So I want to, I'm going to shrink everything down again. I need, to move, I need to move this edge of the flower over. And, and I'm cropped in a little bit on the, my framing of the camera. Um, so that what I, what I need to be doing is looking at the, the screen in front of me to make my evaluations. 
So this is a really critical step and I think it's worth it to take the time to really map out the placement on the page. In the initial study that I did, I felt like the flower is a little bit too large. Um, and so this is an opportunity for me to come in a little bit tighter make it a little bit smaller. And, and I kind of like the idea of building additional space around it. Um, you know, something that you would see in, in a Rembrandt portrait, for example, is um, you know, when, a, when a portrait is isolated in, the, in a relatively kind of empty background, there's so much more space than we might initially be aware of. And that space can and actually pull our eye in and create the suggestion of increased importance on the subject. I want to take some just some basic measurements. So I'm holding my pencil up against the reference image, closing one eye, so I flatten the depth. I'm giving myself monocular vision, and I'm taking just the overall height from the tip of the top petal to the bottom of the bottom one, and I'm comparing that to the width. And so what I'm determining is that if this is distance here um, is equivalent to the distance from this point of the far left petal to that to the stem over here. And I can't quite that kind of puts that stem right here. I can't, I don't quite have, I guess, oh, well, actually that reaches right there. So I can take that measurement, turn it, and that puts the, the base of the, the stem right in here. So that's a nice placement for me. And then I, then I have enough room for this, this one over here. And I'm just gonna kind of block that in. Again, really broad mapping out of the forms um, intentionally get, staying away from any specific detail. Um, but overall, I think this is working out pretty well, and I'm going to make some adjustments as we go along. Um, hopefully, there's we're out of, um, out of our technical glitches. I hopefully, <laughs> we've burned through all of them today. Um, if you do need to refresh the page, it might be helpful if, you, if it's kind of bogging down for anybody. Um, Oh good, so it looks like we have some, some of those suggestions there to, to refresh the page. Um, maybe you're saying, I punched a hole in a plain white index card and I put the hole over parts of the picture to tell the difference between what's lighter and what's darker. So I think that's a great tool to use to help evaluate um, value. And it's one that is often used in painting to help evaluate a color because sometimes it's difficult, especially in some of the tertiary color mixes, the, you know, the grays, um, to determine what its base hue is. Um, and so by isolating it, um, you can see it more clearly, see that you know, it's perhaps more orange or more blue, etc. cetera. Um, one of the things to be mindful of though is that when, with a small hole like that, especially in the context of the white um, uh, note card, index card, it will, that value will, will appear darker than it actually is. Um, but it's a great way to evaluate the relationships between values so you can move from one value to the next one and go back and forth and use that to evaluate the difference between those values rather than the absolute value as seen through that hole, if, if that makes sense. Um, that can just be some of the, the challenges, I think, sometimes when, um, because what it does is it takes that, that value and it isolates it and it puts it in the context of white. Um, and so that's one of the things I'm also doing now is I'm trying to get rid of the white of the page as much as possible. So with that kind of laid out, now I'm doing this. I'm using the side of my hand to just kind of smooth it out using the palm side of my hand and I'm building up a haze here. I'm not worried about that because if I look at that flower, there's, I, I can see a distinction between the brightest brights and then some of the other tones within that flower. So even though the flower is generally pretty light, there is still variation there. So as I build up this haze on the page, that forms the shadows and then I'm gonna erase out those highlights. So. All right, so I'm just gonna build up some of these values and I wanna to start to establish that gradient. So as you're moving, and as your, your pencil, you can see how quickly I'm moving. I'm also rolling it in my fingers so that I'm, I'm constantly kind of rounding out the, um, the, the core of the pencil. And I'm trying to be mindful of, of areas where I'm building up value and it's starting to get a little chunky on that surface. And where it's a little bit light, I'll press down and kind of fill in those areas change the direction of your marks. And, and I'm gonna be working in this background area a lot. And so it, over time, it's gonna gradually smooth out. And then you yourself are gonna decide how smooth do you want that background to be. I kinda of like the tooth of the paper. 
Um, and it might be interesting to see some contrast between a little bit kind of rougher, more modeled background and the, the smooth flower there in the middle. So, um, and this, you know, just like with every other drawing that we've done in the series, we're building it up as we go, um, which puts you in control of the amount of detail. Uh, so you can decide for yourself, once we finish this, if you need to go even farther to refine it. So, um, uh, Sue, you're asking, what if you use a gray colored paper instead of index card? I think that is a wonderful idea, especially if you can find a middle gray, that can help to, to do that. Um, you know, there are also value finder tools that you can get that have, you know, five or seven step value scale that have little notches cut out of them. And so then what you can do is you can compare the value of your study to that value scale and determine from there which one it's which one it is. I think Richeson offers one of those um, if, if I remember correctly. It's not something that I particularly use a lot um, but it can be helpful to um, it can be a helpful tool early on because just remember that value, values are all about relationships. They're kind of like piano keys, right? You know, so you, you, have a, you have a note range and you have all of the octaves on the piano laid out. And so it's the difference between the notes that really matters, you know, and so you can move those, those relationships up and down um, from that. And then and that kind of gives you a little bit of control over, the, um, over your drawing. All right, so what I want to start to do is I want to start to think through the shape of some of the shadow areas. And so as I'm doing that, what I'm looking for is, you know, I'm drawing this shadow here uh, where these two petals overlap, coming across over here, and I'm looking for this shadow, but I'm putting it in the context of this one. And as I'm doing it, I'm also putting my awareness down here to see where is it relative to this form. It's still really rough, but it gives me some sort of context. And this is the mindset that I have as I'm starting to lay down these marks, is constantly checking in uh, about where I am on the page. And then the center of a flower gets darker in here. Um, and then I can compare that to the shapes that are forming throughout the rest of the drawing. So moving very quickly, I don't want to get bogged down in the details at this point. Thinking very generally, um, I haven't made this explicit, but at this stage when I'm looking at the reference photo, my eyes are out of focus, which helps me to not get bogged down in the details and see the overall form for the, uh, you know, for the, the finer details. And then there's this, there's this wonderful shadow right in here that makes this kind of S curve. Ideally, at this stage, as we're looking at this, it would be almost like we're looking at this through frosted glass. And then we're going to be bringing in the line later on to help define certain areas. Uh, and, and if you, you know, play around with the, the way, you know, different ways of holding the pencil. I'm using an overhand grip right now. I also hold it like this sometimes. You'll have seen me hold that, hold it like this in, in multiple videos. Um, but whatever you need to do to continue to engage the, the side of the pencil. And again, don't forget to keep rolling it around. That's something that I just need to, needed to remind myself to do. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep coming back to this background as a way to kind of clear my mind. Um, it's a, you know, this is where all, you know, the center of focus is. This is where my mind is going to. And it can be a lot to, um, to stay fixated on this form throughout the entire drawing. I need an escape valve somewhere, you know, a pressure release valve. You know, as the pressure builds up, as I focus on the flower, I need some, some areas just to let that vent. And this background is a great way to do that as well because I don't have to put much thought into it, I'm just, but I'm at the same time contributing to the drawing. Uh, if you're worried about pressure, if you're thinking about pressure as you're, as you're filling in these areas, try to think about rocking the stroke a little bit. Put a little bit more pressure on the, the center of that pass, lifting on either end. You know, so I'm kind of exaggerating it right now, kind of lifting. Um, but, you know, that prevents you. I, I could start to see some kind of blotches forming down in here um, where I'm bearing down a little bit too much at the end of the stroke. But that happens, and it's okay. Um, and then you just start to darken the area around it to try to fill in some of those areas. 
All right, so now I think we can, um, uh, I think we could start to refine things. I think overall the forms are looking good. I'm going to do some kind of angle sighting. I'm going to look at that angle. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare that to the drawing in front of me. Um, so I'm closing one eye and I'm aligning uh, my pencil with this part of the flower and then this part. But so these two, the tips of the, the petals, trying to find an angle and then comparing that. And I think this one needs to come out a little bit more. So this is where I can start to use my eraser to do some negative drawing. Just that general form, this kind of generally triangular form. And I can do that with these two petals right now as well, where it looks like the, the tips are directly uh, they're vertical right here. So I think I need to come across this one a little bit more. I need to bring this over a little bit more. And then uh, this one up here, it kind of wraps around a little bit. Um, and, and one of the things that might be helpful is to try to break down these stretches along the contour into a series of short straight marks rather than trying to get a curve. Because then what can happen is that we end up locking into that same curve, repeating that same curve over and over again, and losing a sense of the variety of the forms. Uh, let's see. I'm going to, I want to get this kind of axis here. I'm going to try to refine that form. And so as I follow up along the edge, I want to be mindful of creating lines. So the way I'm creating this, them is I'm still using the side of the pencil, but I'm trying to find that path. And then once I'm kind of on that path, I can drop the pencil and draw down um, rather than using a line like this and then filling it in. Again, I want to prevent myself from creating those embossed marks. And you could see in those, some of those areas that the uh, the graphite was just kind of smudging on the paper, but then I just had to bear down just a little bit more to um, to kind of clean that up. Still thinking generally, I'm not I'm not getting any into any specifics. I want that general form with that general axis here, these kind of general paths along there. It's a lot of generals right there. And then I'm going to double check those angle sightings again, comparing this angle here and then this angle, because this should be fairly vertical. And then as I come across here, there's a point at which these two petals overlap. And I want to place that intersection relative to other landmarks that I have. So in this case, I have this intersection point here. I want to evaluate the intersection. It's, it's a little bit, it's, it's up and off to the left a little bit. There's a slight angle to it. Um, and then if you are new, um, you know, one of the things that we like to do here is, you know, to call out questions in all caps, just to, it's more likely that I'll see them. Um, I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of questions come through, but feel free to, to shout out any observations you might be making. If you're following along, where areas that you might be struggling or succeeding, things that you want to share. Um, so I do, uh, I do like to have uh, people commenting as we go. Uh, and one of the things about it as well is that I enjoy uh, the kind of the critique process from you all as well. Uh, so as we get along, hopefully I'm describing what I'm doing, um, but if, if you see something that's off, you know, if I'm getting distracted and something is, something is off in terms of the proportions or value relationships, etc., cetera, um, I'm certainly not offended for anybody who might call that out. Um, as long as it's constructive, which generally it is, I don't, I don't think I've really had any trouble with people just being rude. So, um, so this flower here, again, I'm kind of working both positively, additively, and subtractively to try to find these forms and refine these edges. Uh, you know, you're, I'm going to see all these little um, kind of divots and the, these details along the edges that I'm not going to get too locked in with, to at this point. Um, 
again, I want to make sure that I'm still thinking in terms of value and large forms rather than the detail. Uh, now, I'm not going to be able to match the value one-to-one -to, -one to the reference photo just because this graphite does not get dark enough. And so this is where we're going to use the inherent strengths and qualities of the material and try to extract as much power from that as possible. You know, really honoring the, the strength of the material rather than forcing it to do something that it's not capable of. All right, so as we go through here, now I've got this other intersection point between these two petals, and I want to place that in the right spot, generally. And we can continue to correct this as we go. So, uh, you know, again, we're trying to, trying to make a decision and move quickly, not get bogged down in the details. And I'm just assuming that things are, have the potential to be off and that things can be adjusted as we go. And as you can see, as, I, I'm, as I'm working around the edges, I'm kind of I'm working up to the edge to try to find the edge of that petal and then pulling away and kind of feathering that out. Again, trying to move away from line work. Now, that line is going to be really important later on. If you look at the drawings of Sargent, for example, he's really um, really adept at, at using the line in just the right area to add expression and as well as to um, contribute to an understanding of the form. And I find that, you know, using the line to define an edge is best saved towards for the, the end of the drawing rather than early on because we want to hold in our minds this, this idea that this is a three-dimensional object uh, and if we use line too heavily early on, it can sometimes be challenging for our brain to let that go. It's, it's kind of, it's like once it's seeing it, seeing it as a two-dimensional shape, it's hard to then see it as a three-dimensional form. Um, if we start with it, seeing it as a form, um, we can, we're more likely to kind of, to stick with that throughout the drawing process. There's this little... There's an overlap right in here that I want to place properly. Uh, one of the things also to be mindful of is really vary the direction of your marks in that background. If the marks are becoming dominant, if you can really see the direction of those marks, um, consider the direction of those marks in relation to the, the path of the contour. So in this case, it's largely a vertical edge. And so as I'm shading this way, as I'm filling in that background this way, I'm running parallel to that edge. If I make those marks too strong, it's going to pop those forward. The brain is going to do something funky, and it's going to assume that because they're parallel, they're, kind of, they're related to one another, they might be part of the same form. So it kind of links the background and that object together, where if you change the direction of your mark, so we have the vertical edge this way, and then horizontal marks in that background, your brain will more likely accept it as two different objects in two different places in space, if that makes sense. So just be mindful of that. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's really a specific rule um, to follow, but just look at the direction of your marks and see how they're contributing or detracting from the form of the edge. And if you vary your marks in the background, and then generally I think you're going to be in good shape. So now I just want to kind of feather this out a little bit. And then this, this whole part of the flower is in shadow, so I don't have to worry about, you know, nuance a whole lot back in there. So I'm going to play around with that edge and I, make some, I may make some kind of editorial decisions to veer from the reference photo in some areas just to help to establish that form a little bit. And that's the other thing that to con kind of consider is that, you know, this is a reference photo. You have every opportunity to use that how you want, whether you want it to be, you know, 100% accurate and you want your, your drawing to exactly mirror the, the photo, or if you just want to use it as a suggestion and then allow the, the drawing to kind of go where it needs to go. 
Down in here, I really like how that stem is light against that darker background. So what I need to do is build up a little bit more value down in here. And then maybe what I'll do is kind of vignette it a little bit. So a little bit darker down in here, getting to a little bit lighter. I'm gonna see how that plays out. All right, building up a lot of graphite building up that haze. Again, I'm not worried about preserving those whites. I'm gonna erase out those lights later. So, and then with this, hopefully then what will happen is that those, those lights are really kind of pop out. Um, and I find that a bit perhaps more effective than trying to preserve the white um, throughout the entire process. Uh, what I found myself doing um, when I would try to preserve the, the whites is, um, I have so much focus on that that I really couldn't get engaged with the rest of the drawing. Uh, and, and it became kind of an all-consuming pursuit to try to, to preserve those areas and not get them messed up. And then I beat myself up because I'm getting it all messy. And then I try to find all these workarounds to protect it. Um, and, and eventually I just realized, you know, I don't need to spend all that energy preserving it. I can trust that the eraser is going to pull that out. Um, and, and if not, even if I don't get down to the brightest bright here, if I can't get to that white page, I can take everything else down a little bit more in value um, relative to that. Uh, that's one of the things I hear a lot from students is that, you know, there's this strong desire to keep things clean. And, and again, what, like what I was saying is that for me, what I found is that it, it became too much of a distraction and it was pulling me away from the drawing. So once I abandoned that as... Uh, as a pursuit, then it kind of freed me up to just kind of go with it and, and work with the material. You can see my hands are really getting all, <laughs> it's all silvery from that graphite. So this is very much how I would be drawing if I were working in charcoal and we've, we've seen that throughout this series. So what I'm doing now is I'm looking at the angle between those bottom two petals. I'm aligning my pencil up with the tips and I can see this slight angle. It's, there, it's mostly horizontal, but there's a slight downward angle to, the, to find this point here. And so you might be asking yourself at this point, you know, like did our, our uh, you know, our objective here is to draw this flower, and so far I've done very little actual drawing on the flower. I've been spending all of this time on the background, uh, and I'm building my, my way up to find the form of that, that flower. But I've done no rendering, really, in, in that flower. And so as with this kind of horizontal orientation, as I'm using the side of the pencil, I can kind of roll up to, to kind of access the tip as I need it um, and kind of sneak my way up onto it to get a sharper edge when I need to. But I wanna, again, prevent myself from creating um, kind of embossed lines throughout the whole drawing. It's one of the things that is uh, I, I hear a lot from students who prefer graphite, you know, just filling in spaces can take a long time. So hopefully um, you're able to see that, you know, especially if you engage the side of the pencil, you can actually cover a lot of ground very quickly. And I love the, the, the effect of the graphite kind of building up on the surface. And at some point it starts to kind of fill in the tooth of the paper. Um, and it, it creates a really interesting surface quality. Uh, I love that comment, JC, that I'm pretty messy and I love that I can use my messy hands for drawing too. Exactly. You want to be careful a little bit with the, any oils on your fingertips. Um, and you, um, I know pastel um, painters will uh, sometimes use a barrier cream, something like that, that helps to prevent kind of oils and pigments from seeping into the skin. Um, I, you know, the, the skin is an absorbent um, uh, material, uh, so you want to be careful about some of these things. but. Um, so you might be able to uh, test out some of those, those creams a little bit. So, all right. 
kind of, again, building up that haze, saving the brightest brights for last. I'm just, my, my tonal best is being saved for the end of the drawing where I'm gonna pull out those highlights. So now what I wanna do, let's see. I wanna go back through and I'm gonna to continue to refine the form. And actually, what? let me see if I can, I think I can shift this whole thing over. There we go, you can kind of see this a little bit better now. Um, so we're not cropping this thing off. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna go back through again. I'm gonna sharpen up some of the edges. And what I'm gonna to try to do, and I've talked a bit about this before and there have been some questions, but be mindful of halos. So as you're working up to the edges, um, if, if we're not careful, then we, we create the kind of this blotchiness that follows the contour of the object. And that to me pulls me out of the drawing. And so just be kind of mindful of that. So what I, the way I kind of approach that is I may kind of drop the pencil down work my way up to that edge, work my way back and forth to kind of smooth things out a little bit and, and create a smooth gradation. Because if I'm not careful there, again, it creates this halo that kind of parallels the contour and it flattens things out. I mean, we can always address that. So I'm, I'm gonna see if I can actually create one so you get a sense for what we're actually talking about. But now as I'm going through, since I have the big forms established, I, I can be more precise and really hone my observations in these small areas and be less concerned about getting the overall form right. This moves towards finishing, but it's again one of the advantages of thinking kind of big form it gradually into small form because if I get to that small form too quickly I end up losing an understanding of where everything is in the context of the flower. We want to have the big forms established so then it frees us up to really focus on those details in each part that we're working on. So again I'm really just working on that background I'm just refining that, that form as it abuts the edge of the flower. And here we go, this is an interesting compound curve. It curves in a little bit and then back out. And then right in here, there's a little, I love this little form right in here. Kind of breaks up that curve. And one of the advantages also to working on the side of the pencil is I've lost that sharp point right now because I was kind of, I was bearing down on the point a little bit more to find that edge. Um, so I, as I fill in some of the, the background here, it's sharpening that pencil. So I get to that sharper edge. And then there's this kind of jagged edge along here that I can start to illustrate. And kind of going back to the concept of the, the halos around the edges, one of the things that contributes to that is using a line that embosses the page around the contour. Uh, and so if we've, if we've done our work um, by utilizing the side of the pencil, then we don't have that embossed line to contend with. So what can happen is, is that it's just hard to get the material into that line. Um, so it leaves this kind of white edge and we lose some of that sharpness. Uh, Jane is asking about colored pencil. Would I use these same techniques? Um, I honestly I would, but I don't know if that's the right way to do it. <laughs> like, that's just the way I, I work. Um, but I don't use colored pencil enough to really know. Um, the, the artists that I've worked with that are colored pencil artists, somebody like Gary Green, um, he'll he'll kind of create a rough transfer of an outline. Um, onto the page and then kind of build up, but you being very mindful of those um, of the halos around the edges. But I know colored pencil fills in areas a little bit differently. 
Um, but my, if I were to pick up a colored pencil right now and start working with it, I would just be relying on my natural instinct as been developed through my work with graphite and charcoal. So I imagine I would be utilizing it the same way and then evaluating to see what is, is transferable and what's not and what I need to adjust in my process. Um, so that's kind of part of the, the learning of new materials. And I think it's really healthy to do that as well, to, to shake things up. Um, all right, so as I work down this edge here, um, you know, one of the things that you learn when you use the side of the pencil is that you can get a really sharp line. Um, and when you need it, you just, you know, you, it's harder to make kind of a, kind of a quick turn. Yeah, with the colored pencil, there's, I think there's a, definitely a tendency to kind of emboss the page, which could be something to contend with. And I, but I know there's a process by which you can kind of burnish the materials, which kind of gets rid of all of that. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to hear that what you're saying about messiness, it's, you know, it, it, it's all, you're going to have your own sensibility and, and hopefully, um, you know, hopefully you're, 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 what you're doing is connecting with yourself and how you relate to the materials, how you relate to the subject. And that this just provides an alternative. Sometimes what can happen is that we, we look at other people's work and we assume, well, that's the way it's supposed to be done. And we forget that, you know, we have a, we have a chance to define it for ourselves, how we use that material. Um, and so I use, I use the materials this way because that's what works for me. It aligns with how I process information. Um, it, allow, it aligns with how I um, naturally just work with it, engage with the material as a material and as a texture. But you know, hopefully what you're going to do is find your own way of doing that. I'm gonna be careful right in here. I can, I'm seeing that these lines starting to build up. And so now you can see, I, I, it just kind of occurred to me that I've, I've, been, I've worked on this area probably what, about six, seven layers of graphite at this point. I keep coming around to it and that's part of the process. So using my eraser to kind of refine that form. build up that haze again. I can see a line forming around there, so I'm going to darken it up to, to, to create that kind of darker background. And I, I want to be mindful of wrapping around this corner because that can sometimes cause trouble later on. And you can see that, again, this hand is all messy and it's just rubbing against that part of the flower. That's fine. Um, again, I don't have the mental patience to try to combat that and fight that. So I'm just going to go with it <laughs> because if I try to, if I try to fight something, I just, it, I not very good at fighting against it. So this is where some, some of you might prefer to use uh, a mall stick or something that elevates your hand above the paper. Um, so then it's not resting on there, or you might use like a wax paper or parchment or something to help uh, preserve the, that area. But, Again, that just, to me, that just pulls me out of the drawing experience. Um, but use whatever works for you. Ah, here we go. So now we've got this little spot here. And I want to, I'm gonna figure out where that goes. It's directly below this intersection point. What I'm looking for is that negative space right in here. And I'm looking at where this form intersects these two petals. And I can look at the, the thickness of it. And I'm doing some negative drawing to establish where that part of the flower is. And I honestly, for the, I know it. <laughs> I cannot remember what that part, part of the flower is called. It's been far too long since I learned any sort of um, you know, botanical information. So if anybody remembers 
it'd be awesome to call that out. My brain is just not in there right now. So I, got, I gave myself a suggestion of where that form is going to go, and then you can see what I'm going to do is I'm using my kneaded eraser, um, kind of giving myself a bit of a point. Going to erase that back out. Just a little bit. I'm, I'm not worried about preserving this. I just want to make sure that this is giving us the right pathway here. And then we can kind of sharpen this up by drawing in that space around it, looking at that negative space in here. Uh, Mary is asking if mixed media paper works with graphite and charcoal. The mixed media paper that I've used, I've got some black mixed media paper that I've used for some of the exercises in this series. Um, and it seems to work out okay. It just it doesn't have quite the tooth that a, a charcoal specific paper will have. So it um, it's a little bit challenging for, for charcoal, but I think it works. Um, and then in terms of the graphite, I think it'll also work as well. Generally charcoal paper needs a bit more tooth to hold on to it, you know, to hold on to the material. All right. Damon, <laughs> that's the word. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, and then Jane, it's a pistol. Pistol and stamens. Yes, that's right. And I, I, I can't remember which one's which, but. <laughs> I just look at it and say, it's a form. It's this value. What are the edges doing? Um, it is helpful to kind of have a, an understanding of the, uh, the structure of an object. Sometimes it can also be distracting. And you may end up layering that in, so initially starting with, a, with an understanding of a, the kind of the abstract quality of a form. Uh, and then as you get more precise in your measurements and in your placement of your forms, having an understanding of anatomy or or you know, botany in this case, or you know, whatever your understanding of the subject is, um, uh, can help to, to make things more precise. But sometimes getting to that point too early can, pre can prevent us from seeing larger forms. Uh, so when in doubt, if you're worried about the direction of your marks, just use circular marks to fill in these areas. That's kind of what I'm doing along in this area here. So the way I'm holding it is I'm getting some kind of control with these fingers, and the, uh, excuse me, the thumb is applying pressure. So when I need a darker mark, I kind of lean in on the thumb. When I need it lighter, I just kind of let go and use the weight of the pencil on the surface. Wilma, I appreciate that comment. I'm glad that it helps you to understand. Um, if, if I am describing something and you're, you're still unsure about what I'm saying, um, you know, I view it as my responsibility when I'm teaching to find a new way to explain it uh, rather than putting the burden on the student, you know, because we all just we process information in different ways. And so um, getting feedback as I go along about what's sticking and what's not can be helpful because if it's not sticking, I can find another way to address that, that issue. Uh, this, I really I got an, an idea down in here. I think this is going to be a great place to incorporate that line. So I'm going to keep this fairly soft, but I want to start to make this form a bit more precise. kind of feathering things out. I'm looking for areas that are blotchy and distracting, kind of cleaning them up as I go. And again, one of the things that we've talked about a lot in this series is the process, you know, between, you know, making observations and then making your marks. So when I'm, when I'm looking at the subject, I'm trying to be very precise with my observations, understand what I'm looking at, whether it's just, the, you know, the angle, um, the scale of something, etc. And in, in I'm making those quick decisions, and I'm thinking about how I would actually draw that. What kind of line? What direction? How long is it? How short is it? Um, and then when I, once I kind of have that, I'm moving to the paper, 
and I'm more concerned about where I'm at, I'm making sure I'm in the right spot, then I can apply um, what I had just visualized when looking at the, the reference photo. So uh, hopefully that makes sense a little bit, but um, it, it all happens very quickly. And if it's kind of, if it's, if it's a slow process for you, uh, don't you know? Don't worry about it. Stick with it. It'll gradually get um, it'll gradually get more um, kind of hardwired for you. You know, there's that saying in neuroscience that uh, neurons that fire together wire together. The more you do something, the more you do an action um, with um, with deliberate, you know, taking deliberate action on something, um, and you see the results and adjust from there. The more you do that, you, you're your neurological processes will become more wired and ingrained. So initially it can become a burden, but as you go, it just becomes second nature. So that's what I'm trying to do is describe what, what is happening to try to slow it down a little bit uh, because so much of this is just happening without really me thinking about it. Um, all right. Now what I'm gonna do is you can see that I've, I've kind of built up these values I think I've refined the edge to a fair degree, and I can feel that my brain is calibrating to the values. It wants to look at this and say it's white, but I know it's not. I know I can get to a brighter white. I'm going to continue to work on the shadow side. I'm going to hold off that, that gratification of erasing those highlights. And now what I'm doing is I'm looking for the shapes of the shadows uh, where the petals overlap. And I want to be mindful of the direction of the marks. You can see, um, you, you can see the texture of the, the petals there. Um, I'm blocking in the form, and here there's kind of this darker shadow that comes down here, and then when it cross, crosses into this shadow here, it just gets a little bit darker. So I'm trying to be mindful of that uh, transparency of that shadow. Uh, and I'm also being trying to, trying to be mindful of creating lines. I don't want to use lines to define an edge, especially when we're in the form, because as soon as I put a line down, the brain says, oh, that's, that's the edge of an object, and I don't want that. I want my brain to look at this and say, no, that's, a, that's, a, that's texture, or it's a crease on that form, or it's a shadow on that form, rather than a new form altogether. So you, this is where utilizing the side of the pencil is really helpful. So as, a, as we, we look up here, for example, there's some kind of linear texture. So rather than using the point, I'm going to use the side, and I'm just going to wiggle it back and forth following along that path of the texture. And that's going to read more effectively as a natural texture rather than using the point. So we're using kind of the power of suggestion here. And so if you, if you can try to hold in your mind, too, the direction of the, the grain of some of these petals here and align your, align your marks with that flow, that can be helpful. Right in here, there's some interesting things happening. So I see this cast shadow here. And then there's a form shadow here. I haven't used those terms in a while. That's, <laughs> I talked about that a lot early on in the series. Uh, but you know, there's, there are two different types of shadows that you need to be aware of. A form shadow is when you're drawing the shadow that's on the form of the object. The cast shadow is, of course, the, the shadow that's cast by the object onto another surface. So if I look at this area here, there's an overall shadow shape. It creates one overall shape, and then within that, there's the cast shadow of this petal onto this one, and then the form shadow along in here. And it gets dark right in here. And I am not going to worry too much about drawing the pistol and stamen area. Um, uh, Nia is asking, what's the difference between vellum paper and smooth paper for drawing? Is one preferable to the other for graphite? Oh gosh, you know what? That's not something that I've spent a whole lot of time. I used to draw a lot on vellum, um, vellum and Bristol board 
which are relatively smooth and great for illustrations. Um, and I, I've always found them to be um, effective for graphite, but it's been a long time since I've um, utilized anything that is labeled as such, as Bristol board or vellum. But they should work out well. Um, I want to be mindful here where there's this folding of that pedal. I want to just kind of suggest those creases in there. And so as I'm going along, I'm ro rolling the pencil in my fingers to get kind of new uh, uh, forms as I contact the paper, because this isn't perfectly round. Uh, so it's got the little flat spots here and there, and it makes some really interesting natural, um, natural marks there. That's a good question. I'll have to do a little bit of research into vellum versus just kind of smooth drawing paper, if there really is. I, mean, I just remember the vellum being a relatively um, heavyweight paper, and I prefer to work on paper that's a little bit heavier. Um, but uh, yeah, again, find what works for you. And I, what I'd hate to have happen is somebody just not draw because they feel like they don't have the right materials. Uh, so I'm ignoring what's happening in here in terms of the detail. We're going to build that in on top of it. So I'm just going to imagine the, those pistol stamen things. <laughs> imagine that they're gone. I'm just looking for that, that, um, that conical form of the inside of the flower here. And one of the things that I see too, there, I feel like there's a little bit of reflected light bouncing into here. And if I were painting, you know, I, what I would do is create a color shift between their yellow and kind of greenish and then add a little bit more orange and increase the saturation to create that. But I don't have color available to me. So I, what I might do is suggest that through value um, and maybe darken just a little bit more right in this area and here, lighten up in there. And, and to create a suggestion of that reflected light, it kind of breaks up that value and hopefully will help to increase that sense of that turn uh, on the, that pedal. So a lot of drawing, if, if you're going for realism, if that's your objective, then a lot of what contributes to that is variety. You know, so that, you know, at, at every square inch, is, there's some sort of change, a change in value, a change in the edge, you know, whether you're using a heavy line, a light line, uh, no line at all, etc. cetera. Um, so we're looking for variety. So something to kind of think about. But again, that's, that's if your objective is for realism. Um, if you're not, if you like kind of the expressive quality of something that's perhaps more abstract, um, then you might intentionally choose something that's kind of more flat. Yeah, I don't want to take, make an assumption that we're all here to make things look exactly like we see them. All right. Uh, Jane is asking, am I going to go back later to fill in the white spots of the paper with the tip of the pencil? So yeah, I could, I could certainly do that. And so if we're looking at kind of this modeled form back in here, if we really want to smooth that out, I could look for each of these individual tips and just kind of lightly fill that in and really try to get that, that, those spots gone. I don't know as if I will for this one. Um, I kind of like that tooth of the texture there, uh, but I want to see how the texture of the flower plays out, because if this becomes smoother, then um, and I want that background to be uh, you know, uh, more textured, uh, but I do have that texture right in here that I need to look at, and this may be, if I use the shading stump, this may be an opportunity for that to kind of smooth things out, but I want to be careful because I know I need to erase out some of these forms. This could be an opportunity to suggest that. So I'm, I'm trying to be, if when I use the shading stump, I'm trying to be very light with it. And that helps to get rid of some of that tooth and then maybe that'll create that, that contrast and texture that I was talking about earlier.
But again, it's a, it's a mantra that I've, I've used throughout this series is that you're always contributing to the form. So even in this area where I, you know, the shading stump is smoothing out the, the texture a little bit, it's making a mark at the same time. And I want those marks to contribute to the overall form. And there's this darker kind of ridge right in here that I want to create. And some of that tooth of the paper is really kind of nice. It kind of reflects the paper-like quality of the, the petals. So I want to be kind of careful of that as well. So I'm not, I'm not bearing down very heavily at all with this shading stump. And so as I look at that shadow shape, one of the things that you see, I'm, I'm also trying to indicate some sort of transparency. So it's not just a flat value. There's some variation within that that suggests the transparency. Um, and I can also suggest the texture. And again, I'm gonna be coming back in a little bit later to pull out some of those highlights. Um, do I use circular movement to emphasize line variations? Yeah, I mean, I think you want to get good at, um, who's asking that question? Um, Lisa asking a question about the movement of the marks. Yeah, I think you want to get adept at being able to move the material in a variety of directions. And that's in general why it's good to be drawing from the shoulder and drawing from the elbow rather than the wrist, because um, you do get more variation that way. Um, but it's, you know, it takes a little bit of practice sometimes, you know, we get, we get locked into drawing this way. All right. So just use, utilizing the shading stump, creating some of the texture in, in along here. I'm going to go move back to the graphite to kind of pull this forward. kind of laying down a little bit of chart, uh, graphite, and then I'm going to come back in and uh, kind of use the shading stump to kind of smooth that out a little bit. And then there's this, there's this cast shadow here that I want to make visible. And there's this cast shadow along in here. So with this cast shadow, what I'm trying to do is visualize the path and then make my marks kind of stop along that path rather than draw a line. I can move down in here. I'm looking at the way this, this curls along this edge. So this is where now I'm shifting from keeping my eyes blurred and out of focus to in sharp focus. Um, but I, one of the things, and we talked a bit about this and I can't remember which episode, but you know, there's a difference between making an observation directly and you know, with your direct gaze versus indirectly. Um, and we can often actually become more precise when we, we put our attention on a subject, but we're actually looking and focusing just to the left or right of it. Uh, so play around with that and to see help you see where you are actually more accurate. Um, that can sometimes happen with color um, determinations is we can actually become more sensitive to accurate color by looking a little slightly off to the left or right, a little bit indirect in terms of our gaze. I suggest some of the texture right in here. So I'm looking at the, the flow of that texture. And then thinking about that, when we get, get to a cast shadow, it's transparent. So look for some line variation as we get into that. And then we can kind of move around to this one. I'm going to use my pencil. I'm 
All right, so let me see. I kind of lightly drew uh, this in here. You can use my eraser to kind of pull that out. And I think I need to establish that a little bit more clearly so then I can, uh, I can work kind of positively and negatively. Look at the positive space and negative space. Because uh, we get darker right in here. So I want to kind of visualize that path and then darken up around it. And this is where actually what I might need to do is suggest these other forms. So I'm going to use my eraser. And before I make a mark, I'm going to try to calculate where I'm at. So I'm going to slow things down a little bit. I'm looking at the petals behind there and trying to determine where along this path they overlap. Um, and then I want to, once I figure out where that goes, uh, then I want to visualize what that movement's going to be. And then try to strike it. And there's some clarity I'm going to need to, to achieve in this area. But this, this is all about trying to hit it essentially in one go when I get these suggested in here. And I'm not bearing down, I'm just using the weight of the weight of the kneaded eraser. But it gives me some sort of form that I can work with so that now I can use the, the negative space. I can look at the shape of the negative space that's left in here and make sure I'm kind of in the ballpark. So as you're doing that though, you know, when I, I, my focus is on drawing this petal behind there. So I want to make sure that that line um, connects all the way through, if that makes sense. All right, so we're going to go back through. Just monitoring, um, just monitoring the chat here. Looks like we have some <laughs> some issues with names going on here. So hopefully we can get that clarified. But if you have any questions about the drawing process, feel free to shout them out. It's good to see you back here, all of you. So as you can see, I'm trying to avoid, again, the use of line to create that edge. So I'm, as I'm working on this value, I'm kind of working up to that edge, but I'm trying not to draw that line. I can bring that line in a little bit later. Probably getting sick of me here, <laughs> sick of hearing me say that. I realize I've been repeating that sentiment for quite a while now, but I'm just going to give you a sense of where we're going with this. So again, my concern is um, the, the form of the petal behind it, and then I can make some adjustments to this form that overlaps on top. And then what's going on in here? All right. Kind of smooth things out. All right, how are we feeling right now? I'm, I guess I'm kind of talking to myself here. <laughs> um, just want to kind of suggest this form. Before I come in and kind of strike and pull out those highlights, I want to get everything else kind of working a little bit more. And this is going to be the focal point, so I'm just going to suggest some of the form here. And then I'm going to work up here. I'm going to try to find the shape of that shadow and observe how it is kind of a broken curve along in here. All right, and then I'm going to come down here, try to find that path for the stem. All right. Here we go. Now I think what we can do, let's pull out some of those highlights. Let's have fun with that. So again, 
we've been building up this haze on the page, knocking down those highlights, and we've been able to see that we can erase back down a little bit, but that's still not the white of the page. Now what I want to do is I want to look over the form here. Um, uh, Jessica, you're asking, hi, from Chicago, Scott. Have you mentioned at all taking care not to touch the drawing to avoid the oils on your skin? Yes. So that's where I use, why I use the, side, the palm of my hand rather than my oily fingertips. You know, so for me, like, if you're into it, I say go for it. But the oils can affect the paper. Um, and it's going to affect the way uh, the, the materials rec are received on the paper. Uh, so it is something that you, uh, you want to be mindful of. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to work from pedal to pedal looking at those highlights and I'm also looking at the texture. So wherever I can see kind of that texture, I want to, I'm, I'm drawing essentially now with the, with the kneaded eraser. And I'm starting with just a light touch, just kind of tapping along. And I'm going to see how that is. And if I need to get a brighter highlight, I can try to pull that out as well. But this is where, again, we can start to suggest that texture. And um, this is really, I mean, the, vine, the, yeah, the kneaded eraser, it doesn't have a, the ability for really hard edge or to be able to really bear down. So I'm not worried about that. But if you kind of put it on there and you just kind of vibrate it lightly, that can be sometimes enough to, to pull up all the material that you need to. Uh, but one of the things I like about it is because it's, because it's moldable, I can kind of shape it and create these kind of ridges that help to contribute to the texture to create these more kind of naturalistic looking textures. So here it's all kind of there's kind of this crinkled paper quality to it that I can create. And this is where you, you can decide for yourself how precise you want to be. If you really want to get each and every detail exactly the same as the reference photo, go for it. I don't have that patience. Instead, what I'm looking for is I want to look for what type of marks are happening in this area. So in this area up here, for example, they get a little bit sharper, harder edges. Down in here, it's just kind of more broken. Um, and, and I can let my marks kind of reflect the nature of the shapes that are happening in that area, rather than match it exactly one to one. And in that way, it kind of suggests the form, rather than get bogged down in that, that precision but you can decide for yourself how far you want to push that, that precision. Now here we have some really nice light coming in here. Like we have some <laughs> chats going all over the place. Carol, thank you. <laughs> Everybody here is watching along. Thank Carol on our team here who is doing a fantastic job monitoring the chat for us. All right, so here we go. There's a, and what I'm looking for is, is that, that fall of the light along the form of the flower. Um, to help create that three-dimensional shape. I want, I want to feel like those petals are moving back into space. So I want to determine where, where the, the, the hot spot is. So right in along here, it's kind of right in this spot in here where I'll, I'll pull out a little bit more, then kind of feather it out on either end. So I'm, you can see that with the kneaded eraser, I'm just kind of taking these, these quick stabs shaping it, getting to a new spot, moving on. I see you have a question, Nia. Hold on just a second. How are we doing on time? We're about an hour and a quarter. I don't think we have actually a whole lot more to do on this, but we're going to keep going to the end. Nia, you're asking, how can you tell when you've put in too much detail everywhere? I've been criticized for having too much detail because it takes away from the focal point. Any tips on that? Um, it's interesting. I've had that question come up. You know, I've heard from some of you who have been watching 
um, and gotten that, that, that same kind of question. And I think it is a personal choice. Um, the, and, and you want to engage with the material however you like it the most, right? <laughs> like if you love that detail, I think put it into there and commit to it. Um, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do this. Uh, commit to that detail and own it. Um, and see where it goes. I personally, I, I don't have that in me to really just kind of sit and focus too long. I, a couple hours and I'm kind of burnt out. So I try to get everything in as quickly as possible generally. And so I've developed ways to become efficient. Um, but I can tell you kind of what happens um, with details. So the, the, the brain is always looking to make sense of what it's looking at. You know, it's trying to assess uh, based on the visual information, what are we looking at? Um, and, and in general, when we're looking in the world, 90% of what we, we have in our field of vision is out of focus. But we, we bring into focus that 1%, you know, that, that small amount of, uh, of that whole field, we pull into focus, and then wherever we look, that's, we carry that with us. And so we have the impression that we're seeing everything in sharp detail, when in fact we're not. Um, and so the brain is kind of primed to do that work, to take, um, take all of this stuff that's out of focus and find that little bit of that's in focus. So if everything is in focus, it's actually um, out of alignment with, with how the brain actually processes information, and it can actually kind of throw us off a little bit. And in a way, the um, you know we want I, I like to give the mind something to chew on, a suggestion of texture rather than an explicit expression of it, because it engages the viewer's mind. They want it wants to be activated. It wants to look at, at things that make sense of them. So that's the way I kind of view it. And, and that's the kind of the justification I give myself for not having everything in sharp detail. Um, but at the same time, like if that's what, if that's how you connect with it, if that's what you resonate as an artist with and what you respond to when you see it in other people's work, I say own it. Um, it's not a rule in art as much as, you know, just people making observations about what works and what doesn't and, um, and so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, one of the things I want to be mindful of in, as I'm working in this area is what's happening as we transition from shadow into light here. Um, and then right in here, it gets really dark and you can see the way that texture kind of wraps around the bud. And, um, Right in here, there's some really, really interesting form right there. And so this is why I wanted to keep that background fairly light. So when I add these darks on top, we have a little bit of contrast and we're, we're flipping the value relationship in the drawing where this flower is light against a dark background. We come across here and we see that transition where we have this being darker than the background. And now this part being lighter than that background. So, and then the shadow is actually darker than too. So we have this, this flip, this play there that I think is, um, is exciting and it makes that, um, it makes it feel like it's moving through the space here. And be careful on, along in here in this shadow, make it a little bit sharper on the outer edge, a little bit softer on the inside. But again, look for that variety. We don't want that, that edge to be too solid and heavy See where we might be able to soften it in some areas. Um, yeah, I see a lot of good comments about um, about that, and I would you know welcome everybody's kind of uh, your your suggestions or your impressions about you know detail what works and you know it's a question that since the invention of the camera artists have been asking themselves is really what is the role of art now when a when a camera can capture an image of something what can we do as artists that the camera can't but at the same time you know there's a lot of great painting and drawing out there that uses photography as a reference you know i think of like gerhard richter made some comments in his work about that you know, creating work that looks very photographic, but it's oils, and it kind of, it kind of it does some really interesting things with the mind to do that, to, to look at it and say, yeah, it looks like a photograph, and, but know that it's not, and that can also be exciting. Uh, so using just some, some texture contrast in here now. Uh, 
Okay, so here, I, now I'm gonna get back to this area. Um, right when I do this, I say I'm gonna do something and then I do something different. I say I'm gonna work here and then I just erase out that stem. That's the way it works. <laughs> All right, but I want to get back into this one. So again, looking at this area, rather than looking at the very precise detail, I'm trying to figure out, well, what's happening in that area? What kind of marks am I seeing? And try to reference that type of mark rather than match it one-to-one. -one. Um, but if, I think if, you know, if anybody's kind of curious, you know, one of the things I like to do is read books on neuroaesthetics, you know, the, the study of in neuroscience of how we process visual information and there's a lot of good information out there that you might apply to your own work. Um, Alright, so as I'm looking here I want to be careful what's happening along this edge. So I don't really know. Uh, tricky, okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is I see a little bit of light back in here that I'm going to pull out with, using the kneaded eraser. Uh, Jade is asking, what about the grass? I made an editorial decision just to remove that for this, um, in part because I found it a little bit distracting. And in other, for another reason, I, it's, we're already running along. We're about an hour and 20 minutes to get this drawing done, and it, it just would add additional time um, that I, I'm not sure if, if we would all would want to kind of sit around for when the star of the show is the, the, uh, the lily here. All right, so I just kind of knocked that down because I'm observing that this is a little bit darker than this. So I've created a differentiation between light and shadow, but I wanted to be mindful that this isn't quite as bright as this. So this is where I can pull out the light along in here. And there's this kind of light ridge along that. So again, I'm looking at the flow of that, that texture, that grain, letting some of those spots show through to suggest the texture of the flower. Um, all right, I think that works out pretty well. Okay, now we have this. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. There's a whole nest of stuff. So I want to kind of clarify that a little bit, but I think just suggesting it a little bit as well. Um, it's one of the things, one of the things I also like to think about is, is when I, when I first looked at this flower, I, this whole part, I, it didn't even register for me. It wasn't until I started really drawing it that I'm like, oh my God, look at those, those elements. And so in a way I can use that to help evaluate what do I need to spend my time working on is I could see where, where do, where do, where does my mind naturally go? And, um, and allow some of those areas to stay, kind of diminish a little bit. Uh, so now I just want to suggest these, these parts right in here. Using the side of the pencil, I'm just going to kind of allow it to roll in my fingers and I'm not matching it one to one, but again, I'm kind of holding that shape in my mind. I'm doing a quick kind of practice in my mind as I look at the reference photo. I'm, I'm visualizing what do I want my pencil to do? And then I, I come, to the page, make sure I'm in the right spot, and then I try to execute that motion that I just kind of practiced in my mind. So hopefully that kind of makes sense as to what is, is happening, but I, I don't necessarily need to make this look exactly right. So I can see that I didn't get these, I put the space between these two parts where there doesn't exist in the photo. Um, so I don't know as if it's really worth it for me to, to fix it. Is it really about, does it, how critical is it in my mind to make sure that that all of that is 100% is accurate, and for me it's just not. Um, oh, this is an interesting spot. So what I can do with this one, I can see that this actually dark against that lighter background. So I'm going to pull out the, the bring the, the light back in up to meet that. So something like that. Uh, that was a good question though about the grass in the background there. I wanted to, I, I don't know as if I really finished that thought. So if I didn't, if, if I'm leaving anybody hanging, let me know. I think I got a little distracted. All right. 
right? So I need to evaluate looking at the screen here because it's what is projected. It's projecting what was what's happening above me here. All right. So I. Um, all right, I'm feeling pretty good about this now. Now here's where we want to bring in the line. If you're joining us late, um, and you wouldn't have heard me say this, but one of the things we're exploring here in this is, is the power of edges. Um, and, and I can't get dark with that background the way the photo can. Um, I'm choosing graphite, which is just limited in terms of its value range. And so, and I'm just doing this right now to give my, my, my hand something to work on while I'm thinking about what I'm doing. Um, but so, because of that, I, I have an opportunity to use line to define the edge in select areas. But one of the things we talked about was building it up as form first, and then using the line to, uh, to reinforce that form. That's the difference between a contour line and an outline. So a contour line is a line that we use to define the three-dimensional quality of an edge. You know, it's, it's drawing a three-dimensional form using a line that falls along its outer edge. Um, whereas an outline is a two-dimensional line around a form. Um, so as we as we kind of contemplate the edge here, I want to think about where I want to push and pull some of the form. So I'm feeling a, a certain amount of um, flatness here. I want to create a little bit more depth. And so this is where I might be able to kind of bring this petal out a little bit more. I also I talked about a bit about this area down here. I'm kind of losing this form, which is kind of nice. I want, I like that lost and found edge. I kind of like what's happening along in here. Um, but right in here, I think we can, we can draw in a uh, kind of a sharper edge. And what I want to be careful with is to not make it hard and consistent. I want there to be line variation uh, throughout it. And I get really drawn to this edge along here, which feels a little bit weak um, in my drawing. So I can use a line to, to kind of pull some attention to that. And I'm trying to be mindful of my weight and constantly varying it. So I'm kind of lifting and I'm as I'm going along this edge, I'm kind of lifting and I'm pressing down. I'm doing all sorts of things to kind of break that line up. I'm rolling the pencil in my fingers here to get to a new kind of sharp point. And you can see that I'm just kind of scraping it along the, the side. I'm not even using the point of it. Um, now, if I look at this petal here, I kind of, I kind of like what, the way this edge is reading. Maybe sharpen it in just some areas. But right along in here, in the reference photo, I see that jagged edge. Um, and that's where I can use the line to, to kind of suggest that and create some more fluid, expressive marks right in there. Um, but when using line in terms of if you want to maintain a sense of form, think about that line variation and, and be careful about where you utilize it and make it a, a conscious decision as to why you're placing it there. So like along this edge, uh, you know, I think I might actually kind of outline or contour line this this but tip but not along the whole the whole line. So what I'm doing is again I'm looking at the reference image. I'm looking at the path, I'm looking at the shape and trying to visualize what I'm going to do with my pencil. I'm checking in on the paper just to make sure I'm in the right spot and then I'm going to try to strike what I just kind of with what I just practiced in my mind. So trying to make some deliberate choices and deliberate action with my line. So this is this is kind of interesting up along in here, the way it kind of wraps around into that um, that dark background there. I want to pull it out right in along here and allow that tip to kind of fade back in. And so what I'll do is I'll pull a line in right up along in this edge. Because again, this is another spot where it gets kind of jagged and broken. And so this line helps to suggest and exp express that something that's happening in that form, but hopefully uh, it kind of sharpens up that edge a little bit, but it maintains that sense of depth. And then this, this curve right here is really, really nice. And then I want to, I like that fold right in here. So rather than, rather than, um, render this outer edge here. I'm actually going to use a line to capture that fold. 
and then transition down in this edge here. All right, thank you for the compliments there. Hopefully you're all following along. You know, I think we're pretty much done here. Oh, this is kind of cool. I didn't, I didn't notice these earlier, these little old remnants of flowers there. And it helps to break up that edge along here, which is kind of nice. But, you know, I think we're pretty much done. You know, so now if you're following along, you can ask yourself, do you need to stick with this and continue to add detail or not? And, you know, I think this kind of captures it well. I kind of like the, the softness, especially right in here. Um, there are areas where it just kind of shifts in focus and we, let, we lose some clarity and then we, we create some additional clarity in other areas. But, um, yeah, and there's some of these forms in here. I don't know how critical they are. Let me try that out. Ah, this is what I, I wanted. To, I didn't really spend much time on the stem. So I just want to suggest, you know, the, the texture right in along here. And then maybe use the, the rubber eraser. Keeping it simple. Um, but I kind of, yeah, I like, I like that. I think that gradient was kind of a choice to darken this area back here. It was a, it kind of an effective choice. And then lightening it back here so that I have additional contrast to draw more attention to this. It's, I didn't really even notice this at first when I took this photograph. Um, and then as I was drawing it, even I didn't really notice it until I got into it. I'm like, wow, I really like that form. And so I like the way they kind of balance one another. It starts to tell a story too about what this looked like before. Um, and then we see kind of remnants of what, what's coming next to it as well. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining me. I'm going to hang out for a little bit more, maybe continue to refine this, but you know, I think we've really addressed the bulk of the drawing. I come here every Monday, Wednesday. So if you're new, um, be sure to subscribe both here at on the YouTube channel so you can see when we're coming up next, as well as Artist Network. So if you go to the Artist Network Drawing Together page, there's a link in the description below. If you go there, um, you're going to find links to all the show pages where you can see all the different episodes um, as well as the um, the work that you all have been sharing. I think we're over 200 drawings now have been posted uh, that everybody has done as they've been drawing together with me. Um, so check all of that all of that work out. I, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see everybody's work and I've been really seeing improvement from a lot of you that have been posting so and you're very open about the challenges which I think is great so sometimes it just doesn't work and that's okay. That's part of the drawing process. Um, is for you know we're that's why we're here. Is this is all about practice, not perfection. Uh, I'm not doing anything here that is going to be hanging on a wall or in a gallery. Or anything. I'm not going to be selling this stuff. This is really to help me improve my skills. And I hopefully, hopefully for you, is the same as well. And, um, and that it's not about doing it quote unquote right, but kind of always learning from the process and improving. Um, so love to see the work that you're sharing, seeing it on the Facebook channel as well. So go to Artist Network and sign up for the newsletter and subscribe there. Check out all the additional resources we provide. If you're looking for more drawing resources, we've got them there as well. Um, and I will be back on Monday. We're drawing a lighthouse, Pemaquid Point, uh, one of my favorite spots in Maine. Um, I started working on it and I have to tell you, I am really intimidated. Uh, Greg, if you're watching, the architecture is <laughs> it's already kicking my butt. Um, but this, we're gonna be focusing on architecture for uh, a couple drawings over the next couple weeks, um, as well as some still life stuff. And then we're gonna get back into some figurative work following that. So stick with us. Um, I really uh, appreciate all the comments today, um, all the, the great discussion. Like I said, I'm gonna hang out for a little bit more because there's a bit of a lag and we may um, you may have some questions for me, but if I miss it, uh, this goes up as a video um, that you can comment on as well. And I can uh, I check those threads so I answer any questions there as well as at the Artist Network site. So thank you all. Have a great weekend. There you are, Greg. Uh, can't wait to uh, can't wait to share that. So thank you. Have a great weekend.